today. And today we're celebrating World Wetlands Day, which took place yesterday across the globe. Wetlands are a critically important ecosystems that contribute to biodiversity, climate change, or climate mitigation, and adaption. And uh, however, globally, uh, nearly 90% of world, uh, the world's wetlands have been degraded since the 1700s. But this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by three members of the Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee. Uh, Dr. Catherine Pina is a countryside management specialist with uh, Chagas. Uh, Professor Paul Johnson is adjunct professor of environmental engineering at uh, Trinity College, Dublin. And then Karen Dubsky is head of Coast Watch and environmental NGO in Ireland. Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to the, today's Signpost webinar. Good morning, Mark. So, um, so maybe if we just, um, uh, before we get into the presentation, so Paul, you're going to give us a presentation in a few minutes, and uh, Karen, we're going to have a chat about uh, the work that uh, you're doing with Coast Watch and also the, um, the, uh, the importance of wetlands in, in Ireland. But maybe Catherine, if you could tell us uh, from, from a Chagas perspective and uh, what's, what's happening in this area. Yes, well, as well as doing the uh, helping with the questions this morning, Mark, I'm here because of the topic of wetlands and in particular the Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee. So I'm the Chagas representative on the Ram Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee, have been for the past 15 to 20 years, and Karen and Paul are on it with me. Um, and I think maybe to explain uh, rather than my words, um, Yvonne is just going to play a, a two minute video which, ex, which explains wetlands, Ramsar wetlands and the role of the Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee. Wetlands are a vital component of the water cycle, which is essential for life on Earth. They are very diverse ecosystems, purifying water and storing a fifth of the world's carbon. Half of the world's wetlands have been destroyed, so their wise use and protection is critical. Ramsar is a place in Iran where the International Convention on Wetlands was first held in 1971, since known as the Ramsar Convention. This intergovernmental treaty aims to maintain wetlands and to plan for their wise use. The Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee was set up by the government in 2010 to assist Ireland in meeting its requirements as a signatory to the Ramsar Convention. Membership is drawn from a variety of relevant government agencies, scientific and technical institutions, regional and local authorities and non-governmental organisations. The aims of the Irish Ramsar Wetland Committee are to assist in the protection, appreciation and understanding of wetlands in Ireland. That's a very good, useful um, tee up for this morning's discussion. Thanks for that, Catherine. It's, uh, Good to explain the the, the 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 background to this. Um, and maybe Paul, if I could turn to you and if you could tell us about the work that you're doing uh in, in as part of the the the, the Ramsar's group and uh your, your work in Trinity as well. Good morning, everyone. Uh yes, I'm I'm a, a retired uh now professor, but now adjunct uh dealing with the hydrology of wetlands in particular uh, from environmental engineering uh, department in Trinity College. Uh, I've spent most of my career, in fact, working on the hydrology and hydroecology now of wetlands. And you'll hear a little bit more about that in the presentation. Thanks, Paul. And uh, Karen, if you could tell us a little bit about your, your own background and, and the work you're doing in with Coastwatch. Okay, well, I grew up on a farm. My father's side were farmers for generations down in South Wexford, uh, or they were farmers for generations, but not in South Wexford. We moved there when I was a kid. Uh, I studied zoology and then did postgrad and environmental uh, in coastal ecology. So my love is for wetlands and particularly coastal ones and for informed public participation 
in decision making. So Coastwatch is an environmental NGO, it's international, and we share citizen science as a method of informing people. Thanks, thanks, thanks Karen. And uh, we'll, we'll dig into that a little further uh, when we get to talk after Paul's presentation. So I think without further ado, Paul, I think we'll, we'll go straight to your, your presentation. If you could share your screen with us and um, we'll take questions afterwards. Uh, so if you would like to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and send through questions for our, our panel this morning, please do so. And today's session will be recorded and uh, will be available on the Chagas website as well as the, the YouTube channel. And uh, don't forget as well that you, if, you're, if you want to catch us while you're driving somewhere or doing something else, there's a podcast version of the Signpost webinar as well, which uh, can be listened into. So that's great, Paul. Your screen is appearing there. Perfect. That looks good from this end. Okay. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> Yes, what we're trying to do today is to introduce you to some of the aspects of the work of Ramsar and to see how Ramsar and its work fits with the management and protection and indeed now restoration of wetlands uh, in Ireland. Ramsar, as the video suggested to you, is an international convention to which Ireland, along with 171 other countries at the moment, signed up to. And it deals with the policy of how to manage, protect, and indeed restore wetlands. And what I want to do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is to introduce you to some of the ways in which the principles of Ramsar, and you can see them there on the screen, to conserve restore and ensure the wise use of wetlands. And secondly, to identify and protect wetland sites of international importance, how these principles apply in Ireland and how they overlap indeed with our already uh, extensive management of wetlands. The Ramsar sites, the wetland sites in Ireland, of some 45 at the moment, are indeed overlap with the wetlands that are already protected under EU legislation. So you might regard the Ramsar wetland sites as the sort of gold star uh, wetlands. So to, what I want to do is to try and uh, define exactly what we mean by a wetland. It's all very well talking about wetland protection and uh, wetland restoration, but what exactly do we mean by wetland? And here you can see on, on, on the screen the formal definition which has been around under this international convention for uh, nearly 50 years now. Uh, and I'm not going to read it, but essentially it means wet patches in the landscape and also including wet patches on the coast. So I'm not forgetting marine side of wetlands. And <clears throat> further, you can define wetlands or you can outline what exactly we mean by wetlands uh, as to 42 different types. And I've summarized these uh, in the broad spectrum that wetlands actually cover. You've got the coastal and marine, including estuaries, which uh, Karen Dubsky will talk to you about later. Inland, we have the lacustrine, that means lakes, the rivers, including their floodplains, they're all wetlands because they're effectively wet patches in the landscape. The palestrine, to use the academic definition, but that includes bogs and fens and uh, ponds and all ranges of wet inland areas. Not forgetting that there is a classic area of wetlands made by humans, i.e. constructed wetlands, and those come under the Ramsar idea of management as well. Without rehearsing these armchair statistics, as already mentioned in the video, a large chunk of the planet Earth is in fact uh, wetland. And Ireland has more than its fair share, you might say. Uh, it's estimated, and this is a guess, that 18% of the land area could be uh, described as a wetland. But that, of course, may or may not include 
uh, a lot of our wetlands that have been drained or otherwise uh, destroyed. What it includes in plain language in Ireland is raised bogs, blanket bogs, fens, turlocks, lakes, of which we have many thousand, riverine riparian wetlands, things like the Shandon Callows and so on. Plus, and not forgetting, the wide range of coastal and marine uh, wetlands. Just a couple of pictures that to give you a flavor of what we're talking about here, uh, it, under which uh, Ramsar says we have to, or we have agreed to wisely manage such wetlands. We have the well-known Shannon Callows, which are effectively the floodplains of the Shannon uh, catchment. Turlocks, a unique wetland in the Irish landscape. The raised bogs of the Midlands, which we're well familiar with. And there you see one with the edge, the face bank cut away and now abandoned, but causing a number of problems in terms of restoration and management. And of course, not forgetting, as I said, the marine, which is extensive through estuaries, through sand dunes, all around the coastline. What is often forgotten as being wetlands, particularly on a farming scale, is the riverine wetlands of small scale, such as the streams you see there on the left. And they are very rich in biodiversity and very worthwhile in terms of management and protection. Lakes, of which of course I said we have more than 12,000 current estimate. Raised bogs, and all the flora and fauna that goes with raised bogs. And finally, fens. And the characteristic nature of a fen is that it's fed by groundwater rather than just direct rainfall. Just a little bit of uh, description or at least uh, understanding of where wetlands actually come from and why we are so blessed in Ireland uh, for having such a good range. If you look at a little cross-section, imaginary cross-section of the landscape here, exaggerated in the vertical scale, you can see that effectively what makes a wetland is effectively the rainfall, the natural rainfall that has to run off through rivers, over the land, under the land, to the sea. And it is any area of the landscape that is able to retain or detain even temporarily, the water that is ultimately running off towards rivers and the sea that becomes wet for a certain period, maybe a long time, maybe permanent, but it is the detention of that runoff that causes the land or the area of the land to be wet. It is the frequency and the duration of that wetting that really gives rise to the rich biodiversity, the rich vegetation and the flora and fauna that goes with it. And what we find throughout all the different types of wetlands is that the predominant control on the nature of the wetland is the frequency and the duration of that flooding. And of course, that may include uh, on the marine side, the incursion of salt water, which gives its own character to the wetland. Well, I said Ireland is blessed with wetlands, and in theory it certainly is blessed with wetlands because we have a, a temperate wet climate and we have a well glaciated, in most cases, uh, landscape, which has effectively left behind a thin soil cover of undulating nature so that the drainage of the rainfall after glaciation has been often impeded because of the thin soil cover and because of the limited capacity of the soil and the underlying rocks to actually absorb that runoff. So we have literally thousands of wetlands throughout the country. More than two thirds, probably a, a lot more than two thirds have unfortunately been degraded over time, mainly because of the need for agriculture and the need for development of all sorts. The question really is how we reconcile the redevelopment 
or the restoration or the management and protection of the wetlands that we, that we do have and we could potentially have. This map shows you the uh, work that's been done by the valiant work that has been done by the wetland survey in Ireland uh, to try and record and identify and map all of the wetlands in Ireland. And you can see from the density here, no matter where you are in the country, there's going to be a wetland not very far away. One of the main controls, which is why I come from the hydrology side, if you like, but one of the main aspects of the development of wetlands or the occurrence of wetlands is the climate. And as I said, it's the climate and the geology that really drives it. And here you see a map of the annual rainfall on the right uh, and the map of the sum of the types of wetland that you see on the left. And just to cut, cut a long story short, and a lot of work's been done to map all of this, you can see that the blue and the green on the left, there is a map of the, of the blanket bogs in Ireland. That is the blankets of peat that cover the uplands and the areas of the landscape that are under serious amounts of rainfall. It is the continuous rainfall or the very high values of rainfall that are able to maintain those wetlands as wetlands. And you can see the correspondence between the dark blue on the right and the blue and the green on the left, because that's where you get blanket bogs, where you have to have a rainfall in excess of 1600 millimeters per year or so. The red, the raised bogs, the lowland bogs, if you like, that is the peatlands in the central part of Ireland, and <clears throat> not so much on the east, as you can see, because they need a minimum of 800 to 1600 millimeters of rainfall. Sorry, slide is not, there we go. Now, in one slide here, I've tried to pull together the problems of management of wetlands no matter where they are. And it doesn't matter whether it's marine or uh, inland wetlands. You've got a detention of water. You've got a holding or retention of water in a patch of land, or if you like, on, on the margins of the land. And that wetland is only going to survive if you have enough water to drive it. And <clears throat> the water may be coming from stream surface water, as you can see, it may be coming from groundwater, which is originally or, originates originally, of course, from rainfall, but has passed through the ground and is emerging in the wet patch on the surface of the landscape. It may be that the wet patch is beside a stream or a river, in which case the uh, water source is from the flooding or the occasional flooding of the stream. What you find, of course, is that that supply of water is what is bringing in more or less nutrients that are required to drive the vegetation. And that vegetation can be exceedingly diverse and rich, and you have the buildup of vegetation over a period of many hundreds or even thousands of years. And in the case of a bog, that uh, accumulation of vegetation is retained within that wet area and you get those deep sequences of peat, which these days has been very much regarded as a benefit in terms of its storage of carbon because the decaying vegetation, the poor drainage, which is perhaps an ironic aspect of, of wetlands, the poor drainage has allowed the vegetation to accumulate at something like a millimeter per year in the case of, of bogs. And that doesn't sound like very much, but when you work over 10,000 years, you have clearly up to 10 meters of peat in many of our raised bogs if they haven't been cut away or damaged. So increasingly, not only is a wetland 
because of the sources of water and the nutrients carried by it as rich areas of biodiversity, they're also a rich store of carbon. And that, and that makes them extremely valuable in their role as uh, moderation of climate. The result of that inundation and that retention of water, which comes and goes according to the season, according to rainfall, et cetera, is what gives rise to the diversity of vegetation. And just as a simple schematic, you can see here that there's often a, a gradation of vegetation at the edge and in the middle sometimes of a wetland where the water that is supplying the wetland comes and goes and, and raises and lowers according to the climate and the geology that is partially draining it. This is the natural regime of the wetland and the type and nature of the biodiversity and the vegetation and all the animals and invertebrates that go with it uh, depend on that natural regime not just the water level itself, but the regime, the coming and going of it. And that's what makes it so difficult to manage and to come up with what you mean by, quotes, wise use under Ramsar. Here's a similar picture of a sketch of a fen, which is different to a bog in the sense that its main supply of water is from groundwater and groundwater being particularly rich in nutrients or richer than nutrients than natural rainfall means that the nature of the vegetation on a fen is dramatically different depending on the quality of the water is being supplied. But equally, it makes it very difficult to manage and to protect and to control the uh, nature of that uh, vegetation and indeed the nature of the protection that you try and apply. You can see that it's very important in protecting a wetland and indeed coming up with ideas for wise use is not only just to put a fence around the wetland but also to look at the ways in which the water arrives because if you interfere with the supply of water to the wetland then you're going to impact the wetland itself. And I'll give you one or two examples before the end. We shouldn't forget, of course, that it's not just the vegetation. Uh, it is, of course, the bird life, the animal life, the insect life, that so much depends on the vegetation and the life, including, of course, fish and the aquatic life that goes with many wetlands. And this is just a picture of one picture from a community developed restored wetland in Cabra in Tipperary to remind you that diversity is exactly what it says, diverse. If we look at the actual values of a wetland, why do we need, what do we get out of a wetland? Why do we need to protect it? This is the sort of academic list that you will frequently come on. I'm not going to dwell on it other than to to mention the broad aspects, and this is sort of academic language that's used here, but erosion protection. That's what happens in a river, even if once you have a vegetated wetland along the riparian the banks of the river, then you have a measure of erosion protection. And of course, the same applies to marine. Flood protection is controversial. Uh, in the sense that not all wetlands uh, are able to perform that particular role, but many do, and you'll see one in a second uh, when we look at uh, turlocks. Water supply. Many wetlands do act as a water supply, provided that the water supply doesn't overcome the need to protect the biodiversity values of a wetland. Water purification you've heard about. Carbon sequestration, as I mentioned earlier, the role of a wetland in storing carbon is becoming much more recognized in recent years, particularly in the light of climate change. And of course, we have fishing and foraging activities. This, of course, applies to wetlands across the world, to what extent these ecosystem services, as they're known, 
uh, apply to Ireland depends on the wetland and the situation. But we shouldn't forget at the end of the day that recreation, tourism, and particularly the cultural aspects of wetlands are fundamental to our values uh, in wetlands in Ireland. Just a, a simple uh, slide here to illustrate the difficulty in defining and in managing the role and the values of wetlands, particularly peatlands, in their role as carbon sinks or uh, as carbon stores, if you like. You see on the right a simple flowchart, but it, what all it does is, is illustrate two things. One is that the role of a wetland in carbon sequestration is not a simple one. The plants, the growing surface of a wetland needs carbon dioxide to grow, photosynthesis. But equally on the decay side, the vegetation will release carbon dioxide. And in a peatland that is underwater, such as a bog, then you will find that there could be a lack of oxygen, which can allow uh, the carbon in the vegetation to be released as methane. But overall, there's an exchange going on uh, in the life of the wetland. But a good, well-managed wetland is one that will have a net exchange that results in an accumulation of carbon and therefore becomes a carbon store, as I mentioned earlier. The wise use, if you're going to use a wetland for other purposes, such as water supply or hosting other things like renewable energy, then you need to be able to control the water levels, which is particularly true uh, for the management of carbon in the wetland. The water levels are key to making that exchange benefit the storage of carbon rather than release it. So the management includes the whole uh, management of that exchange of carbon. And here's a prime example, Ramsar site here, Clara bog, a raised bog in the Midlands. And you can see the damage, if you like, it's not intact. It's relatively intact by the broad spectrum of wetlands, but you can see the cutaways on the both the right and left hand sides of the bog there that have long since ceased, but nevertheless are still impacting on the uh, integrity of the bog and therefore its role as a, an intact bog maintaining the water level at the surface. What you see at the bottom right is the old face bank of that bog. And not only is the water there coming from the bog itself, from the drainage of the peat, but it's also coming from groundwater underneath the bog. And that drainage together because of the cutaway is propagating subsidence and therefore a change in the ecology and a change in the water level system right across into the center of the bog. So that the wise use in terms of using that bog as a not only to support biodiversity, but also as a climate mitigation or a climate moderation function needs very careful engineering in order to restore its function and to prevent that drainage uh, from making the situation worse. Planting forestry, as you can see in the left-hand side of that, is not always a good idea either because the trees uh, on the cutaway there are actually uh, interacting with the carbon cycle in, in not a good way in terms of the role of the bog itself. In other words, they will intercept a lot of the water that would have otherwise gone to sustain the wetland. So what we're trying to do in restoration and indeed, quote, wise use of, of wetlands is to restore the hydroecology. And what you see here is the hydroecology of a, an intact bog on the top pictures there with the type of sphagnum mosses, the insect eating plants, the sundews and so on that you'll find on rain fed uh, 
raised bogs. What we've got to counteract now is the last several hundred years of removal of the peat and how to actually engineer the restoration is challenging. But there's many ways in which that can be done, not only the usual blocking of the drains on the top, which tends to restore the local areas, the local water level areas, but embankments on the edge are eventually able to restore the hydroecology. You can see here a dam, an embankment on the left, uh, edge of the picture, and you can see the sphagnum moss is gradually beginning to colonize and recolonize the water on, on the right. It's a slow process. Finally, just a couple of examples of how wise use can include not just isolation of the wetlands, but management in a more active way that allows the wetlands to function as wetlands, but also to uh, support other uh, uses without compromising that wetland function as a carbon store and as, as a role for biodiversity. Turlocks are a unique feature of the Irish landscape. They flood periodically and they are depressions like any other wetland in the landscape that flood periodically. And they're no, by no means a small item on the Irish landscape. Here you see some 400 of them, but the, uh, that we have mapped over the years. And the important point here is that one, it is they are, occur in areas of reasonable rainfall, but secondly, they only occur in the geology that will support them, which is the limestone, the pure bedded limestone that is subject to drainage and subject to solution. So you get, in fact, depressions in the landscape, in the rock and in the overlying material that is supplied by groundwater coming from carbonate rich rocks. And that gives a unique and characteristic uh, set of vegetation and flora and fauna that goes with it. Here you see an example of a turlock, classic uh, turlock in uh, South Galway. Exactly the same picture on both sides. And you can see on the left, summertime, completely drained and completely exposed and good, very good grazing land because of the nutrient rich water that floods it during the winter. And you can see in this case, a very large turlock, the water of which is coming from the uplands, the sleeve octi uplands, which you can see the beginning of in the back. The water is very rich in nutrients, four cu million cubic meters in this case. And here you can see a diversity of the flora. And you can see the turlock on the right. Uh, this is a nearby turlock, Rahasan. And you can see the dark mosses here. Uh, on the rocks, which we know requires uh, sustainability of at least 60% uh, of the time. They need, require inundation 60% of the time in order to be sustained. The trees and the bushes on the left, if you would start to interfere with the drainage or with the flow in the turlock, will start to move in towards the, the center of the turlock. In other words, you need to maintain the regime. Different turlocks will have different regimes. And you can see three here on the right. The top one, uh, water level against time. That's a year's worth of water level. And you can see the slow response on the top, the medium response in the middle, and the very rapidly changing on the bottom. Each of those will have a different set of flora. But Look at what happened in 2009 and indeed back in the 1990s. This is the main road next to the Turlocks from Shannon to uh, Galway. And you can see the flooding has overtopped the Turlocks. What we're now looking at is not the role of wetlands in controlling or moderating the climate, but the opposite. The climate change that is already happening with increasing rainfall in the west of Ireland is causing uh, the climate change to affect the wetland. Clearly here, there is room for uh, 
control of the wetland or wise use of the wetland to allow the top of that flooding to be removed. That overtopping of the flooding is clearly not impacting on the hydroecology of the natural turlock, but you have to be very careful in constructing engineering solutions to remove it. And finally, we cannot do any talk of uh, Ramsar sites and the management of them without mentioning uh, Polistown Fen, the Fen in Kildare. All I'm going to say about this particular Fen is that it is notorious for having, uh, as some people would say, held up the construction of the motorway past Kildare Town. You can see where the, where the uh, Fen is in the, in the picture here. And you can see the uh, catchment area is the blue in the, air, in, in, in the center of the picture. So the area surrounding the fen is what is supplying the water to the fen. So it's not only a matter of protecting the fen, its wise use and its flora and fauna, but it's also a matter of protecting the supply of the water to the fen, which is what the road was in, in originally was going to do was going to interfere with the water supply to the fen and therefore impact on one of the habitats, in this case, the habitat for a tiny snail. The solution was engineered so that the road could pass through the catchment area without interfering on the flow of water to the fen. So the protection of the fen it's as much a matter of protecting the supply of water to the fen as indeed uh, just protecting, putting a fence around the fen itself. In addition, I should point out that this fen is a major water supply for the Grand Canal. And it's quite feasible and management over the years has managed to allow that water supply to proceed uh, at the same time as maintaining the functions of the wetland itself, a celebrated Ramsar site. Finally, I can't finish without <clears throat> asking you to be careful about unwise use of wetlands. And this is a picture of perhaps two unwise uses or unwise exploitations of wetlands. This is blanket bog and peat cutting on blanket bog on the uplands is a very, let's say, undesirable activity because it allows water to get into the base of the wetland and under extreme circumstances can even induce it will even induce bog slides on the blanket bogs you can see the steep slopes in the back here equally forestry has been uh, labeled as one of the most uh, let's say risky ventures on things like blanket on wetlands like blanket bogs because of the impact on the wetland, the change that it will induce because of drainage and because of the weight of the trees, the changes that it will induce in the wetland functioning. Final slide here, just to remind you that everybody loves a wetland, let's face it, and Ramsar is meant to uh, promote that uh, love of wetlands. Our own poets have waxed lyrical about it. Even Yeats lived in a tower next to a wetland uh, for many years. And uh, <clears throat> his only response to getting flooded was to put his bed on the top floor. But he wrote a poem about it in, this, in the meantime. And of course, we have our own Seamus Heaney, who has written many poems about bogs. So go and visit your nearest wetland come in and celebrate World Wetlands Day, which is what is meant to remind people of the need and the value, the need to protect wetlands and to remind you of their great value, restore or create your own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for such a, a really fascinating uh, tour around uh, the, 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 the wetlands of Ireland and the importance of that. And I think it's really, underlines the need for a mindset change around how, uh, how important wetlands are to our, our own very existence, in fact, uh, based on 
I know a lot of the discussion around the importance of wetlands, particularly from a, a climate uh, perspective and the need uh, for, for uh, absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I would invite uh, Karen uh, to, to join us now. Um, and we're going to have a little bit uh, just a, a quick chat about the, the work that's happening in the coastal areas. Um, uh, this is, Karen, you've been working in this area for a long, long time now. And I know that this year is the theme for World Wetlands Day. Uh, this year is, is around the whole concept of restoration. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and, and why it's so important that we look at uh, restoring our wetlands. Um, thank you very much, Mark. I think Paul has elegantly laid out why to restore, because we've lost so much, and why it's important. It has never been more important because climate change needs natural solutions to help us cope with climate change. And I think a lot of people don't realize how easy it is to do small little bits of work. Restoring wetlands is like, it, it's almost like a iron jumper. We've unraveled most of it. Now let's just knit it back together again. Many, the Irish landscape in most areas is tiny little wetlands beside each other. And so it's so important, like wetlands are an integral part of the landscape. They're, they're connected by so many different aspects of the landscape. So I imagine it's, it's not just uh, one farmer that uh, can have an effect or indeed farmers. It's, it's a broader, broader society that needs to participate in this whole restoration effort. Yes, absolutely. And I really brought it down to me, you know, while I'm a, the coast is my main area. We have huge numbers of about one stream, short stream per kilometer in Ireland. And one of those streams, the Ballymoney stream, we had a recent pilot EIP project, and it really brought it home to me how you can do something quite quickly. So what the farmer at the top of that stream, five kilometer uh, long stream, um, Joe Roach, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning him, is a dairy farmer. And he put in, he added to, he added a wetland at the top with expert advice. He restored a wetland as a stream came down. So this is a stream which rises on his land. And one was to catch a lot of road runoff and runoff off the hill where forestry had replaced a blanket bog. So huge amounts of water come gushing down. And that area of pond probably have to be increased. His next restoration wetland, and then follows into a wet woodland, a small wet woodland, which he had kept, even though he wasn't getting any single farm payments for it. And between the three wetlands, when the water leaves his farm, it is now transparent. And this is after one year EIP. Now there's still the occasional bout of nutrients because a lot of high nutrient uh, water comes into his farm in, in uh, flood spouts. But the next, uh, you have other farms, but you have other, also other landowners. And lo landowners can think, oh, it's only the farmers. But each landowner can do something to the riverbank. They can either unwittingly wreck the bank by putting all sorts of construction waste beside it to enlarge the garden a little bit or they can give space for nature and for the stream. Because when it ends up on a beach, like in us, in our case, uh, Balimani uh, Beach, you want clean water. And that is quite a small society. Those streams are short. And in most of the bathing waters where there is a problem, that is really close to shore. And whether it's farmers or the local sewage treatment or non-treatment plant or a caravan park, we all have to work together. Because that is, uh, I mean, often when we think about wetlands, we don't really think of coastal areas necessarily. Uh, we have a coastline you mentioned earlier in our discussion uh, this morning that we have a coastline of 6,700 kilometers long. So, you know, what are the opportunities there to, uh, to, to develop or to, to restore the wetlands that are uh, along our coasts? And I understand there is a strategy uh, being developed for that. 
Uh, well, the strategy is um, the um, uh, Maritime uh, Planning Act was passed in December of uh, last year, of, of 2022, and is being rolled out, sections are being commenced. And while much of it is sort of focused for further out, the coastal zone is part of it, and local authorities will get responsibility for the near shore zone. So there will be hopefully, or I think it's essential, more clarity as to where the high water mark is. If a farmer, because we have sea level rise and we can see now that coastal vegetation is changing and farmers may feel that um, this is terrible, sea level rise, I'm losing land. Well, if we could clarify whether the farmer actually loses it or whether the farmer could keep that as his land, then there would already be something which would allow management for the farmer for salt marsh. Salt marsh is incredibly important as a carbon store and also gives you, if you have sheep on it, a particularly good taste. And you have in Belgium and in France, the Mouton Pré Soleil, where they get extra price for the animals grazed there. If you don't overgraze, if you arrange it in a really managed fashion, this could be very valuable. And in front of the salt marsh, you quite often have seagrass, which is an incredibly important carbon store as well. And in my vision, the farmer who's adjacent to that seagrass could ideally be able to get some sort of management function as well. Because the other difficulty I have seen, really noticed in the last four years is, that farmers are starting to drive over the foreshore to even access their, some of their fields because they've lost so much. And they don't know what seagrass looks like. So accidentally, they can absolutely mangle uh, intertidal peatlands, seagrass, drowned woodlands, all of these most important carbon stores. And regarding intertidal peatlands and drowned woodlands, of course, you can't restore them. If you wreck them now, they're wrecked. Thank you, Karen. And um, there's obviously a need for education and uh, awareness around those those uh, those habitats. Um, and I, I I recently came across a website um, that I'm not sure which department had it. They, they were modeling the sea sea level rise in some parts of, of the country where you could actually see where what 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 areas of land could be lost. I'm going to invite Catherine and uh, Paul to rejoin us um, for the questions and answers. Um, but just before we go any further, Catherine, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we say, interventions needed uh, by farmers in, in some cases to to, uh, to maybe bring back wetlands. You know, where where can they go for expert advice in, in this area? Well, I suppose even in the, the most recent acre scheme, we have um, some very good measures there on, on uh, riparian margins, riparian zones. So it's, it is it is mainstream, which is fantastic, you know, now. Um, I, I, go, I suppose the, the Paul just gave the example of the high, or it explains so clearly the hydrology. So it's, 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 it's so... It's not straightforward. It's easy, maybe plant a hedge. I'm always more scared when I'm advising a farmer to to plant, uh, or sorry, to, to to create a pond because you know hydrology is 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 not is a different science, isn't it? And we have a few questions there on how how people can improve and maintain their own wetlands. So we'll come to those maybe. But uh, yeah, well, I think we should probably get straight into the questions because time is is ticking on, and uh, we have a huge interest. We have over four hundred participants this morning from across Europe. Uh, it, it's uh, quite extraordinary the the the, uh, the spread of, of of the audience from this morning. So uh, so we can if we if we if we could pull through some of those questions. Yeah, um, so just a couple of comments first, but very positive about the presentation. Um, a, a nice comment about Quilch now embarking on five pilot bog rewetting projects, greatly welcomed. And then uh, back to the questions. And if you can keep your answers brief, because some of them you've already touched on, or maybe since the question was asked. Um, I, Karen talked about constructed wetlands, but perhaps Paul could have a, a further comment on, on your view for using constructed wetlands for runoff. Yes, they, they have a very useful role to play uh, in, in controlling runoff. 
we built and analyzed a constructed wetland for the control of or for the management of runoff from the uh, M7 motorway some years back. And uh, <clears throat> the key thing is that you have to design them appropriately. Uh, while they can be used very effectively to control the pollutant load coming, say, from a road or from wherever it's coming from, be very careful that you then don't discharge that uh, pollution, if you like, or that contamination into the groundwater if you don't line your wetland properly, or indeed, if you don't manage it and you have to harvest the wetland occasionally uh, to allow it to go into the local stream. So in other words, design them. And if you design them properly, they have a valuable role. Uh, any couple of quick comments on, on what 